Welcome to the Wanderers History Podcast. My name is Vlad Zamfira, and today we'll continue our examination of the Great Siege of Malta in 1565. After in the previous three episodes into the miniseries, we looked at pretext, context, and the preparations for what was one of the largest sieges of the 16th century in Europe and the Mediterranean. By early 1565, it would be clear that the Turkish Armada would reach Malta and their forces would land on the island. On the 18th of May, 1565, scouts at the forts of St. Angelo and St. Elmo spotted the Ottoman fleet more than 40 kilometers coming from the southeast. Immediately, signals were given to inhabitants to take shelter into fortifications and Mdina and Gozo were warned with two large fire shots. Grandmaster Jean de la Valette immediately realized that the Ottomans would want to land at Marshalok, large harbor eight kilometers from Birgu. A hundred knights were sent and Ottomans actually aborted the landing, not wanting a direct confrontation just yet. So they sailed further south and by nightfall, part of the fleet set anchor at Mgar. The next day, on the 19th of May, would prove extremely damaging for the defending forces, as a knight called La Riviere was given a stealth mission with 12 soldiers to try and locate any enemy troops and if possible capture one Ottoman soldier. It all ended in a minor disaster as his cover was blown by another knight from Dina called Vendo de Mesquita, nephew of the governor, who was killed by the Ottomans. Meanwhile, a Neapolitan renegade who escaped the Ottoman army was captured by defending Maltese forces, divulging that the aim was to take Malta and then Gozo, relying on a huge navy, more than 50,000 soldiers, provisions for six months, and large quantities of ammunition. However, He did tell the defenders and La Valette that the two pashas of the Ottoman army and navy, Mustafa, pasha of the land forces, and Piale, pasha of the navy, were at odds with each other. At the same time, La Valette was distressed upon hearing the news that La Riviere had been captured not only because they were friends and close, he was also a valiant knight, but also that he would be tortured to death to reveal information about the defenses of Malta. It is reported that Riviere himself had told his torturers, quote, What good will it do to torture me? You will learn nothing from me except that you will never take Malta. End of quote. Knowing the urgency of the situation, that night of the 19th of May, La Valette had sent a Genoese knight called Salvago, to Sicily to inform Don Garcia Toledo, the viceroy and Philip II's main commander for this conflict, about the impending siege. On Sunday the 20th of May, after anchoring at Mgar, the Ottomans returned to Marsaschloch, or as it was known in Italian, Marsa Shiroko Bay, and very easily they were able to camp in the valley near Birgu, that also had fresh water supplies. They quickly advanced by taking small villages like the one at St. John. The next day, on Monday 21st, they were able to land most of their ammunition. More than 40,000 Ottoman soldiers were shown and paraded to the Maltese, who tried to respond very quickly with cavalry attacks. For five hours, Fierce small-scaled skirmishes happened until La Valette gave an order to retreat. The next day on the 22nd, another display of Ottoman strength, this time near the fort of St. Michael. It was also on this day when the first important Ottoman war council takes place to decide where to attack first. Mustafa Pasha said that Mdina, St. Michael and Birgu should be bombarded at once, and indeed he had a majority of support in the council. And if he went with 10,000 soldiers to Mdina, 
Bobby writes that had this plan went through, Malta would have been lost. However, Piale Pasha vehemently disagreed, stating that the Sultan entrusted the fleet and thus most of the mission in his hands, hence he had military superiority over Mustafa. Hence, he wanted a better harbor and regarded the safety of the fleet as essential, knowing that Toledo would wait for the right time to counterattack. Mustafa bitterly disagreed, but in the end conceded to securing the Mursamucento harbor, the one that today divides Sliema and Manuel Island and Valletta. This was essentially the heart of Malta and the best defended region. The crucial mistake hence from Piale's strategy was to attack St. Elmo firstly. They thought that they could take this fort in less than two weeks. Their second worst mistake would be not to wait for Drago Reis. On Thursday the 24th of May, after assessing the severity of the situation, La Valette decided to free all chained prisoners, pros- promising them rewards and freedom if they fought for the defense of Malta. What followed between the 25th of May and 16th of June would be a constant heavy siege on the fort of St. Elmo that managed to hold on. However, on the 2nd of June, Dragut Reis joined the fleet and it was described by Balbi in the following. Quote, Dragut Reis, or Torkud, to render his Turkish name more accurately, was one of the greatest corsairs in the history of the Mediterranean. Born in 1485, he was 80 years old when he came to Malta for the siege. He had been a lieutenant under the famous Barbarossa, and, on the latter's death, Dragut became the uncrowned king of the Mediterranean. He was known to his fellow Muslims as a drawn sword of Islam. Although in his earlier career he had been at variance with the Sultan Suleiman, the latter had recently recognized Dragut's abilities by confirming him governor of Tripoli. He knew the Maltese archipelago very well, having raided both islands on several occasions. Among his many successes against the Christians was his capture of Bastia in Corsica, when he had carried off 7,000 captives, and of Reggio in Italy, when he enslaved the whole population of the city. It was Dragut who had captured Tripoli from the Knights of St. John in 1551. An old adversary of La Valette, he was undoubtedly the most able of all the Turkish leaders. He was described by a French admiral as a living chart of the Mediterranean, skillful enough on land to be compared to the finest generals of all time. No one was more worthy than he to bear the name of king. Unquote. Now to briefly talk about Dragut Reis. As Balbi said himself, he was arguably the most experienced naval commander the Ottomans had. And he was a talismanic figure for Suleiman the Magnificent because he fought at the following battles. At Pravetsa in 1538, one of the lar- third largest Mediterranean naval battles of the 16th century and a crucial Ottoman victory that forced the Venetians to admit defeat in the third Ottoman-Venetian war, he led that effort. He also led a successful invasion of Gozo in 1551, followed by the Ottoman capture of Tripoli in the same year. In 1552, he defeated legendary Andrea Doria, Genoese commander, with French assistance at Ponza. He was crucial in capturing Gerba, and he was by far the biggest threat to Malta. The scale of the siege of Malta can be only be described as apocalyptic, as on the 2nd of June, 
1565, in only 24 hours, the Ottomans had fired more than 6,000 cannon shots at Fo Fort St. Elmo. For Dragut Reis, Fort St. Elmo was very important, and he realized that in order to conquer St. Elmo and Fort St. Angelo, that were still communicating with each other, he aimed to complete a siege at St. Elmo, so he could isolate the latter. However, things would dramatically change, as on the 17th of June, Dragut was mortally injured when he was hit by splinters from a cannonball, which hit the ground close to his position. It was not clear if the shot was fired from St. Angelo, or if he was hit by friendly fire from a Turkish battery. Dragut somehow managed to linger for a few days, but he died from his wounds on the 23rd of June. Also on the day before, the 16th, frantic fighting went on and on. An undescribable racket composed of noises from artillery, Ottoman shouts, drums, and falling walls. For seven hours at St. Elmo, wave after wave of fresh Ottoman soldiers were fended off. After losing more than 1,000 soldiers, the Ottomans decided to retreat. However, Lavalette had lost Captain Medrano, who would be buried among the Knights of the Grand Cross, a great distinction offered to him. Medrano, had been one of the most important knights and captains at the defences of Malta. By Monday 18th of June, there was no sign of Toledo and his relief force, and he was already ten days too late. The only relief came from the news of Dragut Reis being incapacitated, and also the death of Master General of the Turks, Soliaga. Finally, on Saturday, 23rd of June, after heavy losses, the Ottomans managed to storm the Fort of St. Elmo. For Lavalette, this was a tragic piece of news, as he lost more than 1,500 soldiers, 18 nine knights, and another 27 knights wounded and taken to Birgu. Had Garcia Toledo had arrived as promised on time with his relief force, the situation might have been drastically different. The situation was looking grim for Lavalette and the Maltese defending forces, with St. Elmo taken by the Ottomans. There was no sign as of yet of Toledo's relief force. Only positives were the heavy losses on the Ottoman side and the elimination of Dragut Reis. In the next episode, we will look into the second half of the siege, the even more dramatic siege of St. Michael, the arrival of the relief force from Toledo, and the routing of Ottoman forces from Malta. Thank you for tuning in at the Wondrous History Podcast. Make sure you subscribe for more content from the podcast, and stay tuned for the next episode.